first Gigi. And that he was for more than 40 years before the public with never a setback. Actually, if Caruso had survived, the two would have been non-competitive. Even when they sang the same roles, their objectives were quite different. For some years before his death, Caruso had been moving on toward the heavier, darker, and more dramatic parts, while Gigi remained to the end a true lyric tenor. Beniamino Gigi was one of six children of a poor shoemaker who supplemented his meager earnings by acting as sexton at the Cathedral of Reconati, a little town southeast of Rome. In the choir of the Cathedral of Reconati, Beniamino, at age seven, was known as Il Canarino del Campanile, the little canary of the belfry. The students of the Portuguese seminary in Rome used to summer in Reconati, and of all people, their cook was the first to think of the Gigi voice in terms of something not merely to enchant the hometown choir loft, but the entire world. To Benjamino's disappointment, he was not admitted to Don Lorenzo Perosi's famous choir of the Sistine Chapel. The age limit there was 15, and Benjamino had already turned his 16th birthday. But he was admitted to the Academy of St. Cecilia, and there he found the teacher who stayed with him and outlived him, Enrico Rosati. And during those lean years, there was always a parcel of food waiting at the gate of the Portuguese seminary from the cook. Young Beniamino's next step was a competition in Parma, organized by Cleofonte Campanini, the general manager and first conductor of the Chicago Opera. His fine showing in that contest would have won him a contract in Chicago, but the First World War intervened, and so America was robbed of the debut of Beniamino Gigi. He made his operatic bow at Rovigo, in La Gioconda, October 14th, 1914. Out of the many offers following that debut, Gigli chose Seraphine in Genoa. In Bologna, he sang his first Faust in Mephistopheles, which was to be the role of his debut at La Scala under Toscanini and at the Metropolitan. In his first 12 years here, he sang 369 performances. Bohem, 31 times. Gioconda, 29 times. La Fricana, 28 times. Andrea Chenier, which he created at the Metropolitan, 27 times. Faust, 24 times. Gigi had it in him to get applause at spots with which other tenors, even Caruso, the public would let go by in utter silence. But with Gigi... They didn't always wait until the end of the aria and the inevitable high note. Such a place was just before Celo e Mar in Gioconda. We just heard the beginning of the aria. It's a great pity we don't have the lead-in on records, too. The words are buona notte, good night, and it's not a flashy passage. It goes up only to a G, but when Gigi made that ascent mezzo voce, the house came down. Another such passage was Questa e Mimi in the second act of La Boheme, the place where Rodolfo introduces the little flower maker to his friends, you remember. Of course, this is one of those melodies Puccini just throws away. You haven't heard it before, and you don't hear it again in the entire work. Yet other composers have written whole operas on less melodic material. Gigli tossed it off, too, but the show would stop, and the house would go wild until order could be restored.
Gigi made his Metropolitan debut less than a month before Caruso's last performance here. Caruso died the following summer, and the Metropolitan needed an attraction and needed it fast for its next opening night. Caruso had sung every opening night throughout his career except one, and at this point, Gallicucci was finally brought into the company. Opposite her at her debut that first night Traviata of 1921-22 was Gigi. Madame Gallicucci once told me she'd rather sing with Gigi than Caruso, which for her repertoire was exactly right. One of the works they often did together was Lucia, and here we have Gigi in a passage from the tomb scene with the Metropolitan Opera Chorus and Orchestra. <laughs> Many Fausts, many Manons opposite Bory. But Gigi's first role in French was one no other tenor has sung at the Metropolitan before or since, Milio, the Knight in Roadis. The work lasted only five performances, but here's Gigi's way with the little obad, Vanamon Ma Bien Aime, as fine an example of Metsubochi singing as you'll ever hear. <laughs> That record was made in 1946, when Gigi was 56 years old. Now we want you to hear a record taken nearly 10 years later, when he was 65. It was made in actual performance at one of his farewell New York recitals at Carnegie Hall, April 1955. Applause and all. Did you recognize Lohengrin's farewell to his swan? 
The Italians tell you Carmen is a pretty good Italian opera with a French libretto. Many of them feel the same way about Lohengrin. But that voice. Rodolfo Celletti, the Italian critic, says Gigli's records are documents of a method that Italian teachers and singers handed down for three centuries until 50 years ago, almost miraculously, it reached a lad from Recadati in La Marche, son of the verger in the local church. Gigli went through life, lived, moved, and had his being in true grand opera style. In his retinue when he traveled were 15 people, valets, secretaries, and so on. He built himself a villa of 60 rooms at Reconati on an estate which can support 2,000 tenants. Even before Caruso, there must have been a healthy chunk of Neapolitan in every tenor, and this program would not be complete without a Neapolitan song from Gigi. The one we've chosen is Maria Marie by Ernesto di Capua, the composer of O Sole Mio. Vocal gifts, we all know, seldom transmit themselves. But Gigi lived to see his lovely daughter, Rina, launched on an important career as a soprano. They often appeared together on the same stage and made some fine records together. Alas, there's just not time for one of them this afternoon, perhaps another time. And for our final recording today, we've saved the improviso from Andrea Chenier, which Gigi sang at its first Metropolitan performance. On the little memorial card given out in the church on the morning of his funeral is a quote from the poet and patriot, Andrea Chenier. Con la mia voce ho cantato la patria. With my whole voice, I sang my country. <laughs> Guardo e profondo, e ai prati colmi di mio. Fifteen years before his last public appearances, Grove's Dictionary had this to say. The type of singer Gigli represents is not to be expected in his perfection more than once in a generation. And it goes on to say, Gigli sings with the whole force of his body as naturally as a game cock fights. Such energy one hair's breadth misapplied would mean a stricture fatal to the tone. Unquote. But Gigi, like that game cock, knew what he was about. <laughs>
na 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 io no no fa Oh, <laughs> 